My name is Dr. Jeffrey Borer. I'm a professor in multiple departments and former chairman of the Department of Medicine and the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at SUNY Downstate Medical Center in New York City. Um, I have just presented a talk about the results of the precision trial, uh, which was a comparison of the COX-2 selective non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, celecoxib, with two commonly used uh, non-selective non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen and naproxen. The, uh, the importance of this needs to be understood. About 15 years, 20 years ago actually, the first COX-2 selective cyclooxygenase-2 selective blockers uh, that were non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs were approved by the FDA. These were rofecoxib and celecoxib. Within a few years, uh, since many people have arthritis and take these drugs, uh, data had been accumulated and suggested that there might be some cardiovascular adversity associated particularly with rofecoxib, which was trade named Viox. Uh, <clears throat> th this came from a meta-analysis of a variety of trials, uh, particularly those using higher doses than, than those for which the drug was labeled. That created a great deal of concern. And about 10 to 15 years ago, uh, a controversy arose as to whether COX-2 selective non-steroidal anti-inflammatories should be used at all, particularly in patients with known or suspected coronary artery disease because of the results of the studies done with rofecoxib. These conclusions were carried over to celecoxib as well, even though the data with celecoxib were not nearly so suggestive as with rofecoxib. Uh, as a result, <clears throat> A hypo uh, an hypothesis was generated by Garrett Fitzgerald at the University of Pennsylvania, suggesting that because COX-2 selective non-steroidal anti-inflammatories block the formation of prostacyclin, which prevents some of the uh, pathophysiological events leading to coronary occlusion, but does not block COX-1, cyclooxygenase 1, uh, which promotes thrombosis, that the COX-2 selectives really were dangerous because they allowed coronary artery thromboses to form without any, uh, any countervailing beneficial effects. This led to the suggestion that there should be some limitation on the use of COX-2 selective agents, which had been developed in the first place because it seemed that they would be less likely to cause the gastrointestinal irritation and bleeding that commonly was associated with non-selective, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Well, a great deal of post hoc analysis was done of studies performed for different purposes. Uh, and they suggested that with rofecoxib, there was in fact perhaps an adverse effect. With celecoxib, uh, the results were not quite so clear, but the Fitzgerald hypothesis was said to apply to both. As a result, these concerns were brought to the FDA and an advisory committee meeting was held about 12 years ago, at which time the FDA concluded that it looked as if, although you couldn't be really sure because prospective placebo-controlled trials really weren't available, uh, the, uh, it looked as if all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs carried some risk, albeit probably small, for coronary events. But there wasn't any good evidence to suggest that there was a difference between the risks associated with COX-2 selective and non-selective anti-inflammatory drugs. However, the FDA said, we don't know, but we want to know. So they went to the manufacturer of celecoxib and said, we want you to fund a trial so that we can learn whether there is a, a problem with the COX-2 selectives. 
at the same time, the European Medicines Agency, looking at exactly the same data, came to a different conclusion. The EMA concluded that there was a problem, specifically with the COX-2 selectives, and it contraindicated the use of these drugs in anyone with known or suspected or at high risk for coronary artery disease. In the United States, a warning was put on the label of the COX-2 selectives, uh, but it wasn't just the COX-2 selectives. The label, the warning was put on the label of all non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, indicating that the FDA thought there might be some concern about coronary events with this entire group of drugs. Okay, at that point, uh, given the, the FDA mandate, a plan was made to study the effects of the COX-2 selectives, or the one COX-2 selective that was left, which was celecoxib, versus the non-selective anti-inflammatory drugs. Post hoc analyses were uh, really not terribly contributory. Uh, the few that were performed suggested that celecoxib really didn't seem to have much of a problem associated with it, if any. And in fact, at that time, uh, a small group of us got together and, and prepared a protocol for a trial uh, to assess whether celecoxib actually was beneficial in patients with coronary artery disease. However, once the EMA made its determination, uh, that trial, which included a heavy contribution from Europe, was no longer possible because Europeans with coronary disease could not receive celecoxib. The trial, therefore, was reconfigured and was undertaken in the United States as the precision trial. Precision was an event-driven, randomized controlled uh, trial with no placebo. It compared celecoxib at its maximally labeled doses to two very commonly used non-selective non-steroidal drugs, ibuprofen and naproxen. Uh, these two drugs were used at their, uh, within their labeled dose range. The study was event-driven, which meant that we didn't know how many patients we would have to uh, uh, recruit in order to complete the trial. We thought it would be about 20,000. As it turned out, because of the dropout rate, we needed about 25,000 patients. It took 10 years to collect that number of patients to obtain the number of endpoints necessary to complete the analysis. There were two analyses performed, a non-inferiority analysis uh, for major adverse cardiovascular events from the antiplatelet trialis group uh, results, which included strokes, myocardial infarctions, or cardiovascular death. Additional uh, major outcome events were, uh, were adjudicated and analyzed, uh, but at the same time, a superiority analysis was done to determine whether adverse events, not only cardiovascular adverse events, but gastrointestinal adverse events and renal adverse events uh, were adjudicated and analyses were performed to determine whether one or another of these drugs was better than the other in, in not being associated with these known adverse events. The efficacy <clears throat> of the three drugs in preventing the arthritis pain, which is what they were being given for, also was analyzed. The study went on for, again, about 10 years, from 2006 to 2016, and was just reported out a few months ago. The results were fairly striking. Rather than being uh, defective or deficient, celecoxib turned out to be better than the other two drugs, better in that uh, the major all-cause mortality results were better, were significantly better with celecoxib than with naproxen and ibuprofen, uh, and better in that the gastrointestinal side effects were significantly fewer, and the renal side effects were significantly fewer with celecoxib than with the other two, while the, ef the efficacy for arthritis pain was approximately similar among all three drugs at the doses at which they were used. So at the end of the day, uh, the results suggest that celecoxib is not inferior 
uh, to ibuprofen or naproxen. We can't carry the, uh, the uh, inferences any further than that because those were the comparator drugs although other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs might be inferred to be relatively similar uh, to ibuprofen and, and naproxen if they're non-selective. Uh, but the results showed that there was, that, that celecoxib was not non-inferior to these other two drugs in terms of cardiovascular events and that it was in fact superior in terms of protection against gastrointestinal adverse events and renal adverse events. Uh, I think the, the key conclusion from all this is uh, that if a patient has coronary disease or is at high risk from coronary disease, there really is no reason not to use celecoxib as an anti-inflammatory drug if the patient also has chronic arthritis and requires chronic use of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Uh, if, if it were me and I was selecting a drug, I would use celecoxib certainly in preference to, uh, uh, to ibuprofen and probably in preference to naproxen. Now, why was the Fitzgerald hypothesis not proven? Well, uh, those of us who were focused on this in 2005 determined that the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs all were salt retaining and they all caused blood pressure to rise. It appeared that celecoxib had less of an effect of this sort than the others. So we did a, a pre-specified sub-study looking at the effect of the three drugs on blood pressure. And we found in results that will be presented publicly for the first time at the European Society of Cardiology meeting it at the end of August in the late breaking trial session, uh, we found that uh, in fact celecoxib increased blood pressure a trivial amount, much less, significantly less than ibuprofen and borderline significantly less than naproxen. These results probably explain the difference in adverse cardiac events among the three drugs. In conclusion, I think we can infer that celecoxib can and perhaps should be used in patients with coronary disease or suspected coronary disease or at high risk for coronary disease who also have arthritis and require treatment with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, the data suggests that, that celecoxib is not inferior to naproxen or ibuprofen in terms of cardiovascular adversities and is superior to these other two drugs in terms of side effects uh, of gastrointestinal or renal origin. So I think the results have important widespread applicability for, the, uh, for use in patients with, uh, with uh, uh, arthritis. These drugs are among the most commonly used in the world. Uh, and thinking about the results of this trial may affect the way you prescribe them, particularly in patients with coronary artery disease.